Greetings, Sports Zone Chicago. This is Jamar Hart with another episode of Sports 101, where we give you an in depth look at sports from a racial, cultural, economic, and social lens from around the globe to Village Road. Tonight's show will be on the economic of economic impact of protests and sports. As we begin, I'd like to read a brief statement. Nothing is new under the sun. Social activism and protest are common in the fabric of this country, which is so oftentimes manifested through sport protest. Many times the reason behind protest is a lack of upward mobility and economic advancement by the group protesting. In the United States, that often is people of the African diaspora. Ownership and an increase of management positions is also not available as it would skew the power curve which spawns conservatism. Remember, conservatism is keeping your wealth, your power, your status, and if I hire more minorities, as head coaches, GMs, executives, then I lose my uh, status. So I have to conserve that. In regards to sport as well as society, protests were minimized during the segregation era while ownership and managerial positions were on the increase. This was due to the majority ownership being the same demographic as not only as the people playing, but as the spectators. The greatest example of this will be the Negro Baseball League. In the 2000s, and particularly in the last five to 10 years, a lot of the protests we've saw in sports will be uh, Colin Kaepernick and his uh, kneeling, um, current NBA protest, um, the shut up and dribble uh, terminology told to basketball players, um, President Obama or former President Obama, excuse me, speaking with LeBron James, in order to curtail this current uh, NBA shutdown. Um, Steven Jackson and uh, his brother, George Floyd, uh, Brandon Marshall, uh, former wide receiver, uh, Pittsburgh native being harassed while he moved to his new neighborhood. Uh, Bubba Wallace in regards to the new situation, uh, Premier League soccer with his racial bands for spectators. And the Milwaukee Bucks recently uh, and other NBA teams boycotting uh, the recent murder in Milwaukee of another unarmed citizen of the African diaspora. Now let's parallel that to 1968 and 69, because remember, nothing new happens under the sun. And this year you had a, a protest in the Mexico Olympic Games. You had the controversy between uh, Wyoming and Brigham Young University regarding the Black 14, uh, the triumphant and mighty San Jose State University track program, who uh, gained power not only on the track, but in the social theater as well. The OPHR uh, group that was uh, manifested through the San Jose State track team, the Muhammad Ali summit, the boycott of uh, the famous New York City Athletic Club track meet, Martin Luther King's assassination in April of 1968, and James Shaq Harris ending the NFL from Grambling State University, uh, who became the first black quarterback to win a playoff game. So again, the social unrest that's happening right now, we saw that before and we saw athletes involved in it. Now I'd like to talk to you about why that is happening. Some events that led to these protests you know the events now, but let's look at the events that happened in the 60s. So maybe we can find some parallels to help us get a solution. I'd like to start off by telling you about the mighty San Jose State University track team. San Jose State University was coached by Bud Winters. I mean, he was a phenomenal track coach. He was a coach there for, I think, 40 or 50 years. And during that time, he produced, he won one NCAA championship. He had 49 NCAA record holders and 27 Olympians. His most famous era would be the Speed City era of the 1960s. During the Speed City era, he had such track athletes as Olympic gold medalist Lee Evans, 
Tommy Smith, and Ronnie Ray Smith. Now, all these guys not only were Olympic champions, but they were world record holders. Evans in 1968, he broke the record in the 400 meters that lasted for almost 20 years. Uh, Smith broke the world record in the 200 that lasted over 10 years. And winner, uh, uh, then you have John Carlos, who laid claim to fame as being the first man to make 20 seconds in the 200. Now, actually, that they discounted his time because his spikes were too long. But again, this was the 1960s, so we know that oftentimes there were excuses made to uh, heed the uh, progress of uh, black athletes. There was also, this is a quick bit of trivia, there was also one athlete he coached named Dennis Johnson. Now, when Dennis Johnson graduated from San Jose State, he, redone, he returned to Jamaica, his homeland, to found a, a, a small college where he began coaching. Uh, today, he is known as the godfather of track in Jamaica. Um, he's provided so many opportunities for young men from the, uh, the, the uh, nation of Jamaica due to the training methods he learned from Bud Winters. Uh, Bud Winters, he was the first one to start the running start. So today, most track athletes, they're used to a running start where they'll be walking and they slowly accelerate into a sprint. Um, that wasn't common in the uh, in the 1960s so he was the first one to do that so dennis johnson went back to jamaica and used these same training techniques and ended up developing world-class athletes such as uh, johan blake usain bolt and uh, various others now let's talk about the mexico olympic games before we talk about that i want to talk about again the mighty san jose state university uh, the city of San Jose State, San Jose, California, is only 50 miles from Oakland, California. Why is that important, you say? Well, in 1966, Huey Newton and Bobby Seals, who, who met at Merritt College in Oakland, California, started the Black Panther Party. So this area was already uh, infused with a racial pride, a racial identity, uh, in an effort by college students to change their way of life and break through the proverbial glass ceiling that was imposed by, you know, America for, you know, hundreds of years. These same track athletes, along with another San Jose, a San Jose State University former athlete, a uh, field athlete named Harry Carson, he became a professor of sociology. Um, they started a, a group called the Olympic Project for Human Rights. Now the Olympic Project for human rights mission was to have all African-American athletes boycott the Mexico games. Um, the reason they wanted to do that is because the Olympics uh, used the concept of nationalism, which is love or pride for one's country to show might and power of all the individual nations. So the OPHR's premise was that the United States used black athletes to promote, to promote excuse me, a false narrative about race relations in this country and they don't show the disenfranchisement of individuals of African descent. Um, as we know, the Olympics only comes around every four years. So a lot of these athletes decided not to boycott the Olympic games, but to protest in other ways. Um, in doing this, the OPHR, they had four mandated tenants that were the key to their organization. The first tenant was to restore Muhammad Ali's boxing title. Muhammad Ali, uh, arguably the greatest heavyweight of all times, was stripped of his boxing title due to his denial of entering the service through the draft. Their second tenant was the remove Avery Brundage. He was the first American named to the head of the International Olympic Committee. The reason that they wanted to remove Avery Brundage is because he had a strong and prevalent racist past. In the 1936 Olympic Games, he defended Germany because there was a contention and, and a large congregation of countries that wanted to, uh, they wanted to protest the Olympics due to the Nazi invasion of Europe. He also had uh, some strong words in the 1957 Games where he stated that all women were minorities and they shouldn't be able to participate in the Olympics. His idea was the Olympics were not for political dissent. 
and it was an opportunity to showcase white nationalism and statehood. He also was against pain athletes, while other countries, in particular Russia and a lot of the Eastern Bloc countries in Europe, not only paid their athletes, but provided them with anabolic steroids. The third tenet was to hire more African-American coaches. Remember, um, track, just like football and basketball at that time, was permeated with a lot of individuals of African-American descent, while the management ranks were not. So one of their tenets was, just like today, how they wanted athletes to transition into management uh, titles so that way they can pass their knowledge down and you know provide a vertical integration through the sport. Their fourth tenet was to not allow South Africa or Rhodesia to compete in the Mexico games. Uh, South Africa and Rhodesia are both countries located in South Africa um, through uh, apartheid and colonialism, in particular through the uh, Boers. Um, they practice a strong uh, regime of apartheid at the time where the minority white community from Europe uh, took control of the country and didn't allow uh, the indigenous uh, African community to succeed or participate in society the way they wanted to. So these were the reasons they wanted to boycott uh, the, the uh, Mexico games. Uh, again, the Olympics is only four every four years. So these athletes decided to uh, not forgo their opportunity or protest in other ways. So let's get to day two of the games. Day two was a 200 meter final. And in the 200 meter final, the gold medal was won by Tommy Smith of San Jose State, where he set a world record and was the first man to run a 200 under 20 seconds. Uh, Peter Norman from Australia won the silver and John Carlos from San Jose State won the bronze. Now, if you didn't know in track and field, once you win the race, you get to go back in the locker room, change clothes, put on your sweatsuit, any other regalia you may wear for your country, and particularly if you're getting on the podium to accept your medal. So at this time, uh, Carlos and Smith pulled out their black gloves and told Peter Norman what they were gonna do. Now, Peter Norman is from Aust Australia, and if you know anything about the uh, history of Australia, again, uh, that was a nation that was, uh, you know, colonized and there was genocide on the indigenous uh, Australians. So Peter, uh, excuse me, uh, Peter Norman was aware of this. So in support of his other uh, members on the stand, he decided to wear a, a patch representing an OPHR. Now, what most people don't notice about this, uh, about this situation is they only show them from their knees up. The reason that is because they also wore no shoes to demonstrate economic poverty in the African community in America. And you see that they have scars around their neck, the protest and lynchings or strange fruit that we have been in the South and other places in this country for so long. Um, hours after this happened, Brundage, who again was the head of the IOC, spread a rumor that he stripped uh, Smith and Carlos of their medals and removed them from the Olympic Village. Um, he heavily persuaded the United States Olympic Committee to uh, dismiss them and they said no. So at this point, he decided if you don't let them go, then the whole track and field delegation is gonna have to go home. So at this point, the United States Olympic Committee sent uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos home. Now, when they got home, you will be surprised. Remember, these are two medal winners in the Olympics, a gold and a bronze medal winner. You would think they would come home to fanfare. Um, there was no Wheaties boxes at the time, but you know, maybe their picture posted in their local community. They came back to racial hatred. The LA Times wrote an article about them uh, stating that their black fist salute was like a Nazi salute. The Chicago Tribune called it embarrassing acts of this country. There was a, a young Chicago American reporter named Brent Musburger who went on to gain acclaim uh, broadcasting the NFL. He called them a pair of black stormtroopers. Now there's one shining light in this and you would, you would not think this shining light will come from this sector. The United States Olympic uh, crew team 
um, who was, you know, 100% uh, European in nature, all students from Harvard, they released a statement saying, we as individuals have been concerned about the place of the black man in American society and their struggle for equal rights. As members of the United States Olympic team, each of us has come to a moral commitment to support our black teammates in their efforts to dramatize the injustices and inequalities which permeate our society. Now to me, if you look at this picture right here, that was an example of uh, some of the propaganda that was being put out. You see it's the Marines which simulate the uh, Olympic games, black America and Africa United. Uh, these are some things that were being said as same way they're being said now. So again, you can see the similarities and we'll get to the solution later. All right, so Tommy Smith and John Carlos were asked about this and they stated a lot of black athletes thought that winning a medal shields you from racism. Remember, there was a lot of talk in all locker rooms uh, uh, during uh, this time uh, after they won about what we're gonna do, are we gonna do something in our sport? And a lot of people uh, decided to go against it stating that they thought that bring home a gold medal would uh, alleviate them from racism. Just like some people now believe that uh, if I live in a certain neighborhood, I uh, skip uh, the professor skip at uh, Harvard who uh, lived in a certain neighborhood and was going in his house and the police, uh, you know, jumped on him. They didn't think it was his, his home. So um, the same way people do that, uh, a lot of athletes thought that. And when they came home, you know, things didn't change. Um, This was uh, very sad because, again, Brundage, the head of the International Olympic Committee, he went so uh, hard and went on such a great level to get uh, two people from his own country thrown out of the Olympics, but uh, he didn't do the same thing in other games. Um, in the 1936 Munich Games, which he did head up, he had no problems with the Nazi patronage and all the regalia and salutes that they did. So again, that just shows the difference how citizens from his own country will not be treated on the same level just due to their color. The next incident I would like to bring up involves the University of Wyoming football team and a Brigham Young for football team. This is uh, often known as the Black 14. And there's also a movie about this. You should go check it out. In 1968, uh, Wyoming and BYU uh, were supposed to play a game. Um, before the game and last year, the, B the Wyoming players suffered severe racial attacks from BYU players and fans. So the next year, uh, the student leader of the Wyoming's Black Student Association, um, he let the players know that the Mormon church didn't allow Blacks to preach. Uh, if you didn't know, the Mormon church owns Brigham Young University, and uh, they later changed this policy to allow blacks to uh, preach. So this uh, student leader in the Black Student Association was telling them about this university. So before this game, 14 of their black players walked in the coach's office on Friday with black armbands on their uh, arms to, to show solidarity uh, with only the Black Student Association uh, and the rest of the blacks on campus. Uh, once they told the coach uh, what they plan to do, they were immediately kicked off the team. He began to assault them and throw racial jabs. He told them to transfer to Grambling or Morgan State, who were powerhouses at the time. So I don't really see that as an insult. Um, he told them they could leave. He had some other good Negro boys that would listen. And, uh, you know, they were just basically turning um, their gift of a scholarship down at a major institution. Again, the same verbiage that we hear today. Um, these same 14 helped Wyoming to two back-to-back -back, uh, WAC championships. And you can see this picture right here. This is about 50 years later at a reunion. The university apologized. Um, they, youth and, uh, they posthumously um, added other members that died uh, into the Hall of Fame and just honored these guys because uh, a lot of them ended their careers and didn't finish at Wyoming. 
uh, because obviously they were kicked off the team. All right, that year, Wyoming lost the remainder of its games and never again uh, were a WAC power. Um, a quick side note in that, uh, students at San Jose State were asked to boycott their game, but the football players decided they wouldn't do it. And instead of wearing black armbands, they wore tan armbands as a unit to symbolize the unity of everybody on the team. Because I guess black and white makes tan. All right, the next event I would like to talk about is the Muhammad Ali Summit. Now, the Muhammad Ali Summit was a meeting in 1967 uh, who oftentimes, as people describe it as a meeting to show solidarity for Ali, who was stripped of his title due to, again, not being accepted, uh, accepting his draft in the United States Army. But that really wasn't the case. Um, if you look at this picture, some famous people in this picture are Bill Russell, uh, Lou Alcindor, who now more commonly known as Kareem Abdul-Jamal, Jabbar, Bobby Mitchell of the Washington Redskins, and Carl Stokes. He was the first black mayor in the United States. Um, this meeting was uh, really uh, to persuade Ali not to go to the draft, but then it changed. So the meeting was held at uh, Jim Brown's local uh, organization office. His organization was the Negro Industrial Economic Union. So again, um, it, most people, they emphasize voting to approve the rights of the not only the African community, but the Afro-Hispanic or Afro-Caribbean community. Um, but he emphasized you know, economics, where you can make money and then buy a certain area of the country or flood it, and then buy a lawmaker to make laws to, uh, to satisfy you and your section of the city, and then just keep doing it vertically. So again, um, one person that's not uh, pictured in this picture is boxing promoter Bob Aram. So by this time, uh, you know, cable TV is in its infancy. So they did a lot of things with closed circuit television. So the way these boxing promoters would make money is they would uh, schedule a boxing match and then they would also buy the rights to the closed circuit television and get all that money. So um, for Muhammad Ali's fights, uh, Bob Aram and one of uh, uh, the Nation of Islam uh, most prominent members, uh, sons, were actually, uh, they went in together on this closed circuit television. So their whole goal was to get, you know, Ali to fight. And their premise was, was you don't really have to fight. Uh, all you have to do is do like Joe Lewis did, go over there, wear your uniform, uh, you know, do boxing, uh, sparring matches, entertain the troops. And uh, he just really didn't want to, uh, he called it clowning in that manner. So he told him no over and over again. At this point, the meeting changed the economics. Well, how can all these people pull their resources to uh, and affect the local communities? Again, you see this now with current athletes. So I'm hoping you see the parallels of the 60s and current times and what athletes and individuals of the African community are going for, going through. The next uh, thing we would like to discuss, uh, bringing you back uh, to current times, is the Black Athlete Summit. So in 2018, at the uh, historic Sixth Avenue Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, now, the Sixth Avenue Baptist Church is famous because uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. held services, rallies there, and it was a focal point for his uh, ministry, uh, not only in Birmingham, but throughout the South. So um, this forum was on improving economic and management opportunities in sport while highlighting past experiences and struggles. So there was a litany of athletes invited. Uh, one of those was James Shaq Harris, Again, James Shaq Harris, a graduate of Grambling State University, um, class of 67, was the first black quarterback to win a playoff game. Uh, later on, he moved up through the ranks of scouting and became a front off executive with uh, several NFL teams. He made a, a valuable statement uh, saying that uh, Coach Eddie Robinson told him, do not come back to Grambling and say you did not make it because of your color. 
Uh, Eddie Robinson was very, very strategic in how he handled James Shaq Harris during his time at Grambling. Uh, Coach Robinson had his running ability as well as his speed because he feared that uh, in the NFL, he would get in that same cycle of being converted to a defensive back or wide receiver. Um, also in this summit was athletic directors. Athletic director uh, from Vanderbilt University stated, please don't confuse change with progress. What he inferred was just because things are not the same, meaning they're not sicking hoses on you, they're not sicking dogs, doesn't mean it's progress. What he was looking for was more advancement in administration since so many sports are predominantly filled with individuals of African descent. Um, after the Colin Kaepernick situation, the NFL uh, pledged $89 million of social issues. Now, as we all know, Ka Colin Kaepernick, the same uh, way that athletes are uh, kneeling now to protest racial injustice in the African diaspora community, uh, he did the same thing, but he was victimized and he was the scapegoat. So he had a settlement uh, that no one can talk about, but he hasn't said anything. So I assume that in his settlement, he can't talk about this anymore. But again, after this situation, um, the NFL pledged $89 million to social issues. The question is, is why didn't the NFL pledge $89 million to enhance facilities, historically black colleges, or businesses in African-American neighborhoods, Afro-Hispanic neighborhoods, schools? Why didn't they spend the $89 million to set up coaching academies? In previous shows, we talked about how Major League Baseball spends millions of dollars building facilities in the Dominican Republic and other countries to monopolize their talent. Why does the NFL only give the social issues? Again, you cannot skew conservatism by giving and investing in all these different causes it will skew the power cycle of the nfl an example of that is currently if you look at college football the zone read is permeating offices on every level from bcs to nai due to the infusion of the zone read you now see an influx of quarterbacks of African descent. These quarterbacks are now moving on to the NFL, where the NFL, who was staunchly opposed to this type of offense, now is adopting it and being successful, hence the Baltimore Ravens. So again, if the NFL wanted to develop athletes from this area, that $89 million could have been used in other capacities instead of social programming. At this point, we would like to take a quick commercial break so you can hear from our sponsors and then we'll come back with our final thought. Compassion, noun, sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. We're all born with it, it's in us. Don't believe me? When you hear a baby cry, something pulls at you. You want to ease that pain. You want to soothe that hurt. No one had to teach you that. It's called compassion, and it's in you. However, at some point you turned it off when it came to me. 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 The cries of my soul have gone unheard, but today, 
You will hear me. My heart has wailed a melody loud enough to shatter your ears and you ignored me. But this week, you will hear me. This body has beat the drums of anguish, only to be silenced. But this month, you will hear me. This year, this decade, this century, I will be heard, and you, and you will be the one to hear me. And when I am finally heard, show compassion, show compassion, show compassion. Remember, it's in you. Welcome back, Sports Zone Chicago family. Any new listeners, please subscribe to Sports Zone Chicago, download the app, and check out this great shows offered for you in the sport content. And now for our final thread. Using Negro League Baseball as a measuring rod um, for sports, the way they operated the game, its structure, you didn't see athletes protesting the league or define as owners due to one thing. Uh, there was no difference um, in the owners and the players. Um, everybody was striving for the same cultural opportunities as well as economic opportunities. Again, this is because the majority of the owners in the Negro League were of African descent. There were some owners that were uh, Caucasian Americans, there's even some women owners, but the majority of Af owners are of African descent. Even the owners were not had to cater to the demands of the majority population. Why? Because they wanted their franchise to operate. So how do we use that now? If the current athletes uh, did the same things that these athletes did, then their shares and revenues would increase. Oftentimes, players served as player managers to even bridge the gap between management and athletes was also diffuse protests. With all the social protests and unrest, there's so many people talking about uh, doing this for your own, going back to black colleges, top athletes doing that. You have Mikey Williams and Bronny James, considering uh, historically black colleges to play basketball. Uh, Meku McCor, who recently signed with uh, Howard. Uh, but again, this is something that's not new. If you look back to the 60s and 70s, you will see Grambling and Morgan State play games in Yankee Stadium. You will see uh, Earl of Porter Monroe at Winston-Salem State or Sam Jones at uh, North Carolina Central. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. If you've never done this, please research the 1975 NFL draft. It is very, very interesting. How so? With the fourth pick, Walter Payton, Jackson State University. With the sixth pick, Robert Brazil, Dr. Doom, Jackson State University. With the eighth pick, Gary Johnson, Grambling State University. With the 43rd pick, 
Charles Smith, the beloved North Carolina Central University. With the 48th pick, Leroy Jones, Norfolk State University. With the 51st pick, Bob Barber, Grambling State University. What are we seeing here? The trend that we're trying to get to now has already been established. Using a caricature of the movie Back to the Future, Marty McFly changed his family's current success by going back and doing events a little differently. The one event that should have been done differently, in particular to sports, would be assimilation. Due to assimilation, all economic power was lost, and particularly in the sports sector. So by encouraging athletes, which LeBron James, Chris Paul, so many others have been doing, Carmelo Anthony, um, DeMarcus Cousins, top athletes to go back to have a Sankofa moment and go back to historically black colleges and use their star power and cachet to build the infrastructure at these or institutions. Things would change. In closing, I want to leave you with one small thought. There was a small religious school in Durham, North Carolina called Trinity College. Trinity College was purchased by some brothers whose family ran a tobacco plantation and later sold cigarettes with a last name Duke. Trinity College name was transformed into Duke University and this small school became known to everyone through their basketball exploits going back to the early 90s. So again, would you know of Duke University? If those players went to North Carolina Central down the street like they did for so many years, as Captain Planet says, the power is yours. Choose us, do for us, do it by us, and we will grow. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time, Chicago Sports Zone family. And look forward to next week's episode of Sports 101 every Wednesday, 9 o'clock Eastern, 8 o'clock Central Time. Have a blessed night.